What up, y'all? Skim Thug. And today, I have a question brought to you by one of my Kofi supporters, a peace bone. As someone who never actually took chemistry in school, how do you read and interpret these diagrams of molecules? Some of them have all the atoms labeled, but others, like triethylaluminum, just have one atom labeled and then a bunch of lines. What do the lines mean? How do you get from these lines to triethyl? Or do you just memorize what each compound looks like? No, God. I'm flattered that you think I have that intellectual capacity to just like memorize all these names. No. In part of getting my chemical education, I had to learn the system of rules that let us go from those structures, which are the structures of the molecules, if you accept that the structure of a molecule can be known, to a name. And this name, also, if it's the right kind of name, lets you draw the structure. This is legitimately a chunk of like an intro chem course. So I'm not gonna give you the full list of the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry Nomenclature Rules or IUPAC rules, because that would be absurd. But what we can do is we can go through triethyl aluminum and TFE, and I can kind of give you a gist of how the magic here happens. So let's start with triethyl aluminum, and let's just start with the name, because the name is more or less its systematic name. So the name itself, triethyl aluminum, has four parts. Yes, the ill is its own part. So the first part, tri, tells me that there are three of whatever is coming next. Then there's the F part, and what the F part tells me is that there are two carbons attached to each other, and that's just like a group, and there are three of these and the ill tells me that that's a two carbon group attached to whatever's coming next. So we got three two carbon groups attached to whatever's coming next. What's coming next? Aluminum. So that's how I know that this triethyl aluminum molecule is an aluminum atom with three groups of two carbons attached to each other attached then to the aluminum. So how do we draw that? Drawing it is kind of easy. First, you draw the aluminum which you just use its periodic table symbol. That, that's what you do. You just put an aluminum on the page. Now, the next part is a little trickier. So with these condensed structures, when you have two carbons attached to each other, it is just one line because the ends of the line represent two carbon atoms and that line itself represents the two electrons that are holding those atoms together. So you got three of those and then you draw another line from one of the two carbons to the aluminum and you've got triethyl aluminum and that's how that one works tfe that's not even a name that's just an abbreviation and if i didn't have a structure here i might actually be in a little bit of trouble because it'd be a little hard for me to know what tfe means but here i can look at the structure of the molecule and i can use that same kind of rule system to tell me what tfe should stand for so if i look at this molecule one of the first things i notice is that there are four of these atoms with f four fluorine atoms. To me as a chemist, because of the rules that I've learned, I know that if there's four of something in a molecule, somewhere in the name is gonna say tetra that thing. In this case, it should say tetra fluoro. So that's probably what the T and the F in TFE stands for. Now that last part though, the E, that's where it gets a little tricky and complicated. The E in this picture here stands for ethene. But I only know that because I know what a carbon-carbon double bond is, where you have two lines between the carbons instead of one line between the carbons in the structure. In this case, those two lines mean that there are four electrons between the two atoms at the, at the ends of the line, rather than just two. This is what makes it a double bond, which incidentally is stronger than a single bond and has different chemical characteristics. And this is why it's important that we be able to communicate the structure of a molecule as specifically as we can with the name. To compare it to our triethyl aluminum, if it were triethyl aluminum, then it would be two carbons with two lines between it, but it's triethyl aluminum, so it's only one line between those two carbons. So as you can see, these molecules are kind of small. They don't contain that many atoms. They're not actually that complicated. You might imagine with a molecule like brevitoxin, if we were to try to apply these rules to come up with a name for that molecule, we'd be here all day. Incidentally, we use computers to do it when we need to. We do need these names, however, because it's very convenient to have a name that I can say plug into a search engine and it gives me the exact molecule I'm looking for. 
Most of the time though, <laughs> in the lab, for example, we will use common or derived names that make it kind of clear with the context what molecule we're probably talking about. An example of a common name that most people are familiar with is acetone or water even, because these are not the by the rules names for these, for these chemicals, 2-propanone and oxidane. But a somewhat more real example is what I do in my research. There is a molecule that I make frequently and I often call it the imp bicycle or imp bic, I-M-P. And if you're in my research group, you probably know what I'm talking about as soon as I say that. It is a bicyclic molecule that is made with iodomethylpropylate. But if you aren't in my research group and you don't know what that bicyclic molecule might look like, then this name is meaningless to you. But because we make these bicyclic molecules so frequently and there are only a few versions of it, I can say imp bicycle in a conversation where I wanna discuss the chemistry of this molecule and the people around me in my research group will likely know what molecule I'm talking about. Although to be fair, I probably will also be drawing it. Now, while the IUPAC name system is very important and very useful, it is not the only systematic naming uh, convention that we have. There's also the INCI nomenclature system, the International Nomenclature for Cosmetic Ingredients, which is what you'll usually see, actually, if you look at the ingredients on, say, your cosmetics or a bar of soap or something like that, toothpaste, which Incidentally, it was one of the biggest letdowns for me at the end of like my Gen Chem 1 class where I learned the nomenclature rules and then still didn't understand the names of things and the ingredients labels. But that's because it's the INCI system. But yeah, this was fun. I actually have been looking for an excuse to make a video like this for a little while. So thank you again to a peace bone for giving me a little bit of a open door for this one. And I'd be curious to know what your favorite IUPAC name is for a chemical that you are familiar with or have used, because some of these names are absolutely insane. I very much do enjoy Oxidane, just because it's kind of, it doesn't in any way, shape or form sound like water. It sounds more scary to me than some of the other fake names for water, but definitely throw some of your favorites in the comments. And uh, yeah, if you got other questions for me, you know, you can, you can hit me up on Kofi. Until next time, it's Kim Thug. Toss a coin to your chemist, oh beaker of plenty, oh beaker of plenty. <laughs>